Now, let me introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Gene Wade, uh, CEO of New Uni and venture advisor at AI Fund. Mr. Wade is not uh, just an education entrepreneur. Uh, he's a visionary uh, who sees beyond the horizon. Uh, with a rich educational background uh, that spans earning his Juris Doctorate from Harvard uh, Law School, his MBA from, from Wharton, bachelor's from Morehouse, uh, Mr. Wade could have taken the cushy uh, corporate road off and traveled. But Mr. Wade uh, uh, took the more difficult road and charted a, a different path, uh, leading uh, at the forefront of educational transformation and, and innovation. Um, his journey through founding uh, University Now and platform learning uh, and managing a network of public uh, charter schools has impacted the lives of hundreds of thousands of, uh, of students, reflecting a deep commitment uh, to making education accessible to all in the digital age. Um, at New Uni, Mr. Wade is pushing the boundaries of uh, traditional education championing uh, innovative solutions that enable learners worldwide to access quality uh, education, uh, no matter their location or their background. Um, his work with the AI Fund is reshaping the educational landscape, uh, integrating artificial intelligence uh, to enhance learning experiences and outcomes. His vision is clear, uh, break down barriers, to education and open the world up to possibilities uh, for students everywhere. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as we delve into the discussions on future ready work skills, curricula, and bridging the technological div divide across Africa, uh, Mr. Wade's insights uh, will undoubtedly inspire us to think bigger and act boldly uh, in this inaugural UPivotal Innovate Africa conference. Let us look forward to an engaging and insightful dialogue on shaping the future of education in Africa. Please join me in warmly welcoming Mr. Gene Wade. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Uh, Ada, thank you for that warm introduction. Um, I'll try to live up to it. And I Appreciate your kind words. Um, thank you to our esteemed guests from Nigeria for traveling across the Atlantic to participate in a really important discussion. Professor Reamer, Professor Jackson, the hosts here, the students who took the time to put this dialogue, uh, this conference in place today, uh, and all the hard work that went into it. So my name is Gene Wade, uh, and I'm an education entrepreneur, social entrepreneur. Uh, about 30 years ago, uh, I was a student here like many of you in this seat, trying to figure out how to get all the work done and what I was going to do with my life. Um, but I want to start because and I want to I want, we're going to talk about some really important topics today about public private partnership and the future of education. But there's always a story. And I find as an entrepreneur, when I talk to other entrepreneurs, is their story that interests me the most. The facts, they're interesting. The stories, you never forget them. And so I want to share a little bit about my story and why I've gotten involved in some of the things I do today. So and just to sort of headline it, I, I work with AI Fund. And AI Fund was started by the team that, um, that built, that co-founded Google Brain. They were the folks that built the T in chat GPT. And then they left and built companies like OpenAI and they started the AI Fund. And they said, we're going to take this technology and go forward and we could see around the corner and we're going to use it to try to improve humanity and make some money, right? Because you do both. Um, you see that with entrepreneurs. You try to marry up both of those. The... Um, you know, I did that work, and I also have a company called New Uni, uh, where we partner with schools around the globe to try to um, expand access to education using, a, using technology, using competency-based models. But 30, 30 years ago, I was a student here. 10 years before that, I got my first degree from housing and urban development. For those of you who are from the United States, that's called HUD. That's the housing project. I grew up in a project exactly four miles, actually. I looked it up this morning. It's literally four miles from this building, but it was a world away, right? So I went to, and I was a kid who was born on the, I, I, I started when, uh, I started school the day that they desegregated schools in Boston. So for those of you who don't know, we had educational apartheid. That meant that blacks went to one school 
and whites went to other schools and never the twain shall meet. And the year I started school, they decided to put us on buses and send us across the city uh, to other schools and send kids to our neighborhoods. And we had police escorts to school every day. I saw buses get turned over. I saw what I learned was that this was really, really important. I saw the fear in my parents' eyes. I can remember that to this day, what it was like to get on a bus as a first grader, knowing that you might get attacked just for going to school. A few years ago, my youngest kid asked me, could you come talk about civil rights to my class? So she's in the fourth grade. And I said, well, sweetheart, I wasn't around for civil rights. I'm too young for that. She said, but dad, other grand the grandparents come. I'm not a grandparent. <laughs> Start with that. So they come and they tell their stories and your stories are better than theirs. I said, OK. So I went to the classroom. It's a group of fourth grade kids, the hardest speech I've ever given. And, they, and so I'm talking about what it was like to grow up um, at the end of educational apartheid in Boston. And I told this stories about, you know, how things how things happen. And I showed a video I found. So thank goodness for technology. So it turns out all this stuff is online now. So I go and I found footage from my first day of school in Boston when they desegregated schools. And it's like, so let's say Ted Jennings, it was some ABC News reporter. And he goes, hi, this is ABC News. And he has the kids in the neighborhood. And he's, so, you know, and, and the kids had gone to the community center and they'd taken them there because they threw bricks through the windows and the kids had, they had to get the glass out of their hair, out of their braid to get them to school, right? And so the reporter standing there and he said, well, what do you think? And the kids were like, we just want to go to school. We, you know, our school didn't have books in the schools were bad and we didn't have heat last year. We just trying to get an education. I clicked the video off and I said, that's my cousin. That's my aunt. That's my next door neighbor. So we did what we were supposed to do. And we, we walked into places where people said, you don't belong and you shouldn't be here. And then I showed the kids how it got better. So my story starts there, right there. I had a front row seat in the, the best place in the world to get an education, four miles from this campus. At the same time, I had a front row seat on how it didn't work. So fast forward 10 years. Now I'm graduating high school. And the people that put that effort together, they said, we're going to help a group of you become social entrepreneurs. And they gave us a scholarship to college, a place called the Freedom House. I was one of the kids there. We called the Advocacy Institute. Some of you who are in ed school may know those folks. Long story short is I didn't finish. I didn't do, I went to a great high school. I didn't do too well because I wasn't motivated because I didn't have anything that really motivated me. Sports kind of motivated me, but not really enough. And so they got us in the room and they said, listen. Um, oh, and by the way, I finished high school. There were kids who finished summa cum laude, magna cum laude. I finished. Thank you, Laude. <laughs> They said, thank you, Lord, this child so I ended up at Morehouse College. But the people who led that effort, and this is the point of one of the points I want to make today. They got us in a room and they said it didn't. They said, listen, you're the first generation that could go to school without apartheid, kindergarten through 12th grade. You're actually no better off than your parents and grandparents academically. It didn't work. We did everything we could. We thought that if you sat in the room with the other kids, that you would get educated. And it's not enough. So some of you have to rethink the model. You have to rethink this whole thing. We don't know how, right? And I'm looking at these folks like, I don't either. But you need to figure this out. And that was, so when you go to college, you figure out how to make this better. How to, and you may have to rethink the whole thing. So I went to college, to Morehouse. And the first thing I did, and this sounds a little crazy, is I actually, I'd never been to, I never had a passport or been to Canada, but I went to Africa. I went to the University of Nairobi. And it opened my eyes that this is not just a, a problem that's national. It's a problem that's global, that young people are doing what they're asked to do all over the world, but we're not creating opportunity for them or there was resistance. They're having opportunity. And our job has to be to solve that. And that became my motivation to then become a good student, get to Harvard Law School and really be the education guy in law school. So when people were thinking about, you know, going to the Supreme Court or being corporate lawyers, I was thinking about how do we build schools? And I would just hijack classes. If you were one of my professors, you were working on education with me. Every class was how do we get a school started? In 1992, there was something called charter schools in the US that was started and there were two charters. And a charter is a private school, a, a public school run by a private organization. So a group of us, many of you in this room, right? Cause I've invited you guys and you're here participating. We said, we're gonna build a network of charter schools. And we went out mostly, and we were black students at Harvard graduate students. And we said, we're going to build a charter network. And people looked at us and said, not with our money. 
So we went to funders and they just wouldn't fund us. So we, we couldn't raise the capital. So we went off and did different things. One of my colleagues started one of the first urban boarding charter schools. Other guys did other stuff. I went to Wall Street and then went back to business school and launched what became the first um, national network of charter schools started by black folks in this country. And we built schools and we didn't just go in and like land the ships in your neighborhood. We partnered. It was all about partnering with people in the community because this it's your community. These are your kids. And we're just bringing no matter how much technology, money and resources we bring. This is your community. And we want to partner with you. Those schools are still standing. And they're some of the best schools in the communities where they were founded. And the same what's, what's fascinating for me is the same teams stayed in those schools for 25 years. Many of those people just left the schools that we built, which is highly unusual in the charter world. But we came at this, not just how do we make the money, but how do we make a difference? How do we rethink the model? And at the time, that was cutting edge. Fast forward a few more years, we built uh, a network of tutoring programs. If you were a low-income kid 20 years ago under No Child Left Behind, you got a tutoring voucher, you could get tutored. A group of us looked at that and said, this is a market. This looks like a market. We don't have to fight and do politics. We're going to just use technology do tutoring. And we grew that from my living room with the help of my good friend here, Isaac Vaughn and other folks, from my living room to a thousand kids around the U.S. Kids who were behind in reading and math are now, we're now on track. And uh, we caught a lot of, we caught a lot of political heat for doing it because the school district said, we like the program. We just don't want to spend our money on your program, even though we're mandated to do it. So I learned a lesson that you, you have to create the right incentives when you build Education. A lot of outcomes aren't just good intentions, it's the right incentives. And you have to harness those incentives to create win-wins for people. And they're not, people who are resisting you aren't always doing it because they think you're a bad person. They're resisting because there's fallout for them personally. And you've got to acknowledge that when you go in the room as an entrepreneur. No matter how much of a Harvard degree you have, a Wharton degree, all this stuff, what matters is there's another human being on the other side of the table and what you're doing has an impact on them. So have some empathy. You, you may be right, but you still may not be able to get done what you need to get done. And you need to be able to convince people that it's in their interest and line up those incentives. Then we went on from that to start focusing internationally. And we built uh, a company called University Now. And what we did is we looked at what was happening in the U.S. around um, around the cost of college. And at the time, I think there was 15 years ago, I think there was 600 million in college debt that U.S. So since the demographics have shifted in the United States, so has the burden of paying for college. As we've, as we've shifted who goes to college, we've also decided you guys need to pay it for it yourselves. So we're not going to subsidize it. We're going to make sure we're going to lend you money. And so today in the United States, Americans have borrowed, have more debt for school, for university than we have for credit card and auto combined. It is the second largest form of debt in the country. It is the largest asset class held by the U.S. government. It's school loans. Just put that in perspective. It's not ships. It's not planes. It's not buildings. It is loans on, that people will spend the rest of their lives paying back just to get their kids an education. So we shifted the burden onto these folks. So we said, rather than trying to attack this at the policy level, let's just put a horse in the race. Let's build, let's use technology to build a low-cost school that was quality and affordable that people could pay for out of their pocket, not the one they might have in the future, the one they're walking around with today. Can, it be at the, can we do it at the same price of the phone bill? Can we do it at the same price of the auto loan? And so we built a, 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 a platform that to, um, to scale up competency-based technology, which is self-paced. So if you think about schools, especially those of you who've come here from uh, other parts of the world, you have correspondent schools and you have cohorted schools. There's nothing in between. What a competency-based school is right down the middle. It's Faculty support, it's self-paced, but it's not a correspondence school. It's a lot of engagement, a lot of support, and it's, and it's at your own pace. And it drops the price down when you do that for all kinds of reasons we can get into. So we built that up. And today, there are 150,000 people going to school in the U.S. at affordable prices with this model. <laughs> Which for me, when I do the math on it, it saves them hundreds of millions of dollars. My mother went to school when I was a kid, right up the street here. She was going to school to get her math degree while we were living in the projects. And she had to go at night and on the weekends and raise two kids and all that stuff, right? It's really hard to do. So having a system that's flexible allows you to do that. So our typical student is a working adult in a call center. They're a frontline worker, and they're trying to get from the call center to the boardroom. You need a degree to do that. 
we, we make that possible. And then we looked at that and said, well, wait a minute, if we can do this in the US, we should be doing this all over the world. And we started piloting this in Africa and other parts of the world where we have uh, friends and, and colleagues. And, and now, we're, now we're doing version two of that. And with my friends at the AI Fund, we're doing it and we're leveraging AI to make it even better. So that's kind of the journey. Here's the point of my story. Most things don't work out, right? Every business plan is wrong. It's just the point of departure. It's a question of how wrong, not is it wrong, right? People, aren't when they invest in you, if you're an entrepreneur, this is educational entrepreneurship, they're investing in you, not ideas. Ideas are great. Everybody's smart. There's plenty of smart people, but it's the folks who follow through, who it didn't work, they try it again. It's the folks, when you look back at their career, it makes sense that they would go from this move to the, they're not just jumping for the next hot thing. They're deciding they've, they've charted a course for themselves and they're trying to make an impact. And each of these things adds up. Right. And so the work I'm doing now, if we're right about it, if we're halfway wrong, it's twice as big as anything I've done, everything put together because we're still on the same track trying to make an impact. I want to end with a story about in some perspective about what's happening and this is really for the students about some perspective on what's happening around the globe, right? So we're in a radically changing world in education right now, right? Higher education is, is in a world that is shifting dramatically, right? So, and we're at a crossroads. We have to decide, are we going to double down on models that don't work? Or are we going to build models that are inclusive, that are making room for the tens of millions of people that are there alive today? And they don't want to want to go to school in 20 years. Are we going to make room? for those people and educate them and prepare them to be meaningful contributors and leaders in our world, right? So the world's middle class is growing rapidly. That's what's driving this, right? By the way, everybody's got a cell phone all over the world. Um, and um, it's fueling demand for higher education. Um, in, 19, in 2020, there are 165, roughly 165 million people in school. In 2035, there'll be 530. By 2040, that number is almost 600 million people. Right. In 1970, there were 28 million people enrolled in college. Half of them were in the U.S. We still think about the world like that. That is not the world we live in. Anymore. The world that what that really says is there will be more people that will attend college in the next 20 years than have ever attended college in the history of mankind. Just let that sink in. That's the world we live in today. Right. So meeting the global demand requires adding a new school the size of the University of Maryland for the next 20 years every day. It's never going to happen. So anybody who tells you that's going to happen, they've just lost track of the world we live in. This is the world that we're not going to build one of those every single day. We can't. We can't even build community colleges that fast. There's not enough concrete. We'd all be in the construction business. <laughs> um, there's a supply to mis demand mismatch in terms of the supply of really talented youth and capacity. It's most acute in Africa, which has the world's fastest growing middle class. Like if you look at those cities, they're, the cities in Africa are the fastest growing with the fastest growing middle class. And what's happening now, the first export, which when I wrote this, I had, you know, it wasn't necessarily true, is Afropop. They're changing the culture on the ground, right from Nigeria. That's the first thing you see coming out of this young, this group of young people who are talented and have access to technology. Um, last year, 10 million students, over 10 million, took interest exam on the continent. There's only a million and a half seats, right? Here's an example of what happened in, in Joburg. They announced on the radio and online um, that there were 600 seats for university at a university in Johannesburg. By 5 a.m. the next morning, 10,000 people were standing outside. So you can't tell me people aren't desperate to get their kids educated. And that didn't end well. There's another picture that I took out. It didn't end well, right? But because people got hurt, but they were willing to get out at five in the morning. Grandmothers, uncles, nieces, and aunts saying, I want my kid to get educated, right? And that's a hard thing to do to get a 20 something year old up in the morning and stand outside at five. I know for y'all, I, I wasn't getting, I was getting home at 5 a.m., not getting up at 5 a.m. Um, so the first observation is there's not enough concrete and money to scale up the current model. So we've got to rethink it. The top 10 jobs in, um, in 2020 didn't, ex didn't exist in 2010, right? And yet, Higher ed's not producing enough, higher education not preparing enough students for these jobs. In the US, the shortfall of educated workers is 5 million. Globally, it's 40 million. And then you ask the, and there's a mismatch. If you ask our college graduates prepare for work, most professors will tell you, yeah, I prepared my students, right? 
the vast majority. But when you ask employers, the answer is less than 50 percent. And then the question is, are they and it's not even are they prepared to get a job in most of the world? It's can they make a job? Right. I had to come up from the grips with the fact early on that I wouldn't be just getting jobs. I'd have to figure out how do I employ people in my community? young people who weren't getting access to opportunities. That's a good reason to build an organization is to give people around you opportunity. So the current model basically is out of sync with the labor market. Okay, last, last, last point I'll make. This is, um, this is George Washington, the founder of our country. Uh, he's crossing the Delaware River. Just to situate this, this quick story I wanna tell you, this is like 1700s. So that's, what, that's the world in the 1700s. Here's what, um, Here's what transportation looked like back then. That's what it looks like now. Here's what medicine looked like back then. I think they're leeching this guy or bloodletting him or something that would be illegal today. Here's what medicine looks like today in the US. This is what lighting looked like back then. If you wanted to study at night, you try not to burn yourself. You had a kerosene lamp, a wax lamp. Here's what lighting looks like today in major cities. That's warfare back then, warfare now. Long, long range communication, anybody? <laughs> communication today, right? You see where this is going. That's education back then. This was actually a schoolroom from that time period, right? This is a classroom here. This is what it looked like when I went to law school a few years ago, right? Our rooms across the, across Mass Ave. The third, the other observation is the current model is outmoded and efficient and it's based on seat time, right? And so we've got to rethink this model because we're not going to build a school the size of the University of Maryland every day for these kids. We don't have, we'd all be in the construction business. So education in the future is gonna look like people getting together with their computers. It's gonna look like coffee shops. It's gonna look informal. And then you get into a classroom and do more formal work. You come together and it's gonna look like it looks in my company. when we all work together around a whiteboard and work on problems. So what I would say to young people is what the folks, those of you who are students, is what my mentor said to me back in, when I finished high school, they said, it's time to rethink the model. It's on you. Right. It just like when I was coming through, I didn't know how we do it. I just knew I would spend my career doing it. I would challenge you all to rethink the model with today's technology, with AI, with smartphone, with all the tools at your disposal, build organizations that are going to matter to somebody in the future. And it means rethinking things and not just holding on to the past, but doing what's right for the kids who aren't even here yet. Uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you.